Recording in progress. Morning. I'll now call to order the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. It is January 25th, 2022, 9 a.m. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Supervisor Friend? Here. One Some moment, please. Trouble with audio. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Koenig? Here. Thank you. Have a quorum? Thank you. We'll now have a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Now consider uh, late additions to the agenda, additions and deletions to consent and regular agendas. Are there any late additions? Uh, yes, uh, Chair Koenig and members of the board. Uh, there is a late, agenda, uh, late addition. Um, it's to consider addition of a late item, agenda, agenda management system 12140 to the consent agenda relating to the proclamation of local emergency January 15th, 2022 tsunami as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of Office of Recovery, Response and Resiliency. Um, there's a board member memo printout uh, and this item will uh, take a action of the board, a majority vote to add it to the agenda. And then on the consent agenda, there's an additional uh, number 27, there's additional materials revised attachment A place this packet pages 366 and 367. So you can now uh, go ahead and vote on that late edition and then it'll be added to the consent agenda. Thank you. So we'll be voting uh, to add the late edition as item 64. Sorry to burden you this morning with my. Thank you. I will be voting to add um, the uh, late edition for the tsunami or declaration of emergency for the tsunami response uh, as item 64.1. Mr. Any... Chair, I'll move to add that item to the agenda. Second. Second. Moved by Supervisor Friend, seconded by Supervisor Coonerty. Any further discussion? <coughs> Clerk, please call the roll. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Honig? Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. We'll now move to uh, item four, announcement by board members of items removed from consent or regular agenda. Any board member like to remove any items from the consent agenda? No, I, I don't have an item to remove, but I'll uh, 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 probably, I might call on someone that is there in person if they want to speak. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Cabot. Uh, We'll now move on to item five, public comment. Uh, anyone wishing to make a public, public comment, please uh, approach the dais and line up. Um, you will have two minutes to make a comment. We'll start by taking comments from folks here in the chambers and then take online comments. You may begin. Bob LaMonica, Santa Cruz. There are two Danner plaques on the county building. Uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, we do require that you wear a mask at all times in the chambers. Thank you. Bob LaMonica, Santa Cruz. Thank you. There are two Danner plaques on the county building. One coming up the courthouse steps. The other, the entrance to the district attorney's office. Their purpose is to cover up abuse of power. In 1987, the victim of DA Danner's at fault bodily injury car wreck was blood tested and the DA was not. And he had just been drinking. 
Overlapping his June 1994 re-election, DA Danner directed time cards falsification, procedurally exonerated by Board of Supervisors Resolution Number 11495. Those two plaques are as historically revisionist as Confederate statues. You are accountable to history. You are accountable to local application of values. Board of Supervisors, take down those plaques. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning, Board of Supervisors and Mr. Palacios. My name is Veronica Velasquez. I'm the SCIU 521 chapter president for county employees here at the county. I want to acknowledge uh, the county's partnership with SEIU. Yesterday, during mediation, we reached a tentative agreement. We strongly believe that this agreement is an important step towards meeting the critical recovery needs of our community and workers. This agreement invests in the services that our community needs and relies on, and sets a framework to attract and retain dedicated essential county workers. Our partnership with management yesterday ensures the county of Santa Cruz can be the best place to live, work, and thrive with our families. Si se puede, onward. Thank you. Good morning, board. I am Alicia Bonner. I am SEIU Local 521 President, and I am here on behalf of our members here with Santa Cruz. It warmed my heart that you guys reached a tentative agreement with our hard workers here. I hope that it fosters uh, a relationship and a culture with our workers here because they deserve to be respected and to be valued. They are the frontline workers of this community. They reach every man, woman, and child of the community. And I just ask that you guys continue an open and honest relationship to have a respectful relationship for your essential workers. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. Good to see you all again. My name is Rico Mendez. I'm the chief elected officer of our union, SEIU Local 521. Um, we represent over 52,000 public employees and nonprofit employees spread across the jurisdiction of 17 counties. And Santa Cruz being one of the most important areas of our state in terms of frontline services, frontline workers, and the needs of the community, the unhoused, the poor, folks that are pretty desperate, right, for healthcare services. And um, we're really excited now that the work that these essential workers have done, these SEIU Local 521 members that are on the front lines as public health nurses, mental health providers, child protective service workers, social workers, roads workers, this amazing group, an amazing spectrum of types of work that the workers do here in Santa Cruz County that we have the honor to represent these workers in as a union. I'm proud that we were able to get to an agreement last night. I'm proud of the work that Veronica and the leaders have done to really paint the clear picture of why investment makes sense. And I'm proud of you all as supervisors to do the right thing to get to a place where you know, we, we each didn't get everything that we wanted, but we got to a place that was fair and that, you know, our bargaining team is recommending a yes vote. We encourage you as supervisors to, of course, uh, vote yes when it comes before you and get the deal done. I also want to flag that this could be just the beginning of something really spectacular and amazing for the people that live here in Santa Cruz County. Working together to draw down more funds from the state for mental health services, for the unhoused, for public health, for social services. That is a real possibility. So moving forward, getting this done and figuring out ways to invest even more in these critical services that the community needs is before us. Thank you so much. Here. Good morning, supervisors, and happy new year. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of rural Aptos. I wanna begin with some good news. I think we all need some good news <laughs> given the times. And I wanna make it very clear that um, Central Fire Protection District is moving in a very positive direction toward uh, district-based elections for their board of directors. 
I request that Supervisors Koenig and Friend reach out to Central Fire and get information about this and make it very well known to your constituents about now is the time for them, for us, to uh, take part in those redistricting lines. Central Fire District is doing a good job, but they really do need and want public input. On the consent agenda today, there are many things that I don't think should be on the consent agenda. Namely, the $5 million allocation to buy the Watsonville Community Hospital. That should be out in the open. That's a huge purchase. This is a huge deal. And I don't think it belongs on the consent agenda. Um, that's item number 41 on your consent agenda. I want to point out um, the excellent water status report, item 45, water resources status report report is one of the best reports I've seen come out uh, regarding this topic. But I want to point out that Pure Water SoCal project is not all that it is trumped up to be. It is, will inject treated sewage water into the aquifer. There are alternatives. The city of Santa Cruz has completed a water rights EIR that would allow them to sell more water when it is available to this district and simply not pump. SoCal Creek Water District is not planning to use any, well, virtually none of the wa recycled water for irrigation other than the free water for 50 years, they're going to give Twin Lakes Church to irrigate their fields. There are other ways and they need to do a better job of public outreach and being more transparent. Um, I want to point out to you that item number 1933 uh, are simply not transparent. You. Your time is up. Thank you. I, I request that in the future public comment have three minutes rather than two because your consent agendas are full of things that people want to talk about. Two minutes is not enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, good morning. My name is James. Uh, this is January 25th, the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. What are there, 3,100 counties in the United States? wonder how many are run just like this one. Um, I'm going to choose to talk about the second AMBAG meeting that I ever witnessed. And I believe it was item 9B. Everyone in there was given information in late November and early December about something they needed to talk about that had to do with their individual cities and counties and districts water supply. That meeting was on a Wednesday, the Thursday before everybody was given a complete revision of what was actually going on. What was interesting is at least five people of I think the 26 that were present were really asking questions and voted no on this. They said such things as the state agencies are not talking to each other and the state agencies are not talking to the cities and counties about what their needs are. I'll quote this, shame on them. I did do a little bit of research to find out what that actual additional change was. I haven't found it yet, but um, <clears throat> something else that seemed kind of interesting, many people don't even know what AMBAG is. It basically controls Monterey County and this county, but one of the head speakers used the words like, we are the control organization. What the hell is that supposed to mean? So here we are dealing with corporate Santa Cruz, looking at a corporate flag, and um, you guys don't support the people. You were never designed to support the people. This whole thing is a farce. Um, what, when are people gonna come out of their trances? I mean, Carrie Mullen, that PCR test was never designed to diagnose anything. It was simply a duplicator. And those tests have given case numbers that are just completely false. So there's some issues going on. Thanks. Thank you. Is anyone else here in the chambers that would like to speak? Thank you. Pull this down a little bit. Does that Perfect. sound good? Okay. Well, good morning. My name is Stony Brook. I'm here speaking in regards to item 55 on the consent agenda. Um, I join you today actually as the president pro tem of the United Veterans Council for Santa Cruz County. UVC is the representative body for our veterans organizations in this county, such as the American Legion, 
Veterans of Foreign Wars, Blue Star Moms, the Marine Corps League, Military Officers Association, and numerous others. We see ourselves as the voice of the estimated 10,500 veterans in our county. I also serve on our Human Services Commission as Vice Chair and as your veteran liaison to this body. I work at the Veterans Village Committee since its inception. I wanted to share that the United Veterans Council voted in December 2021 as unanimously in, unanimously in support of the creation and funding of the Veterans Village Project in Ben, ben Loman. The infusion of the home key funds outlined in our item 55 today can make a major difference in how this project becomes a successful model for future efforts to house our at-risk and marginalized veterans. While the Veterans Village itself is not a temporary shelter or halfway house, the concepts of peer support, wraparound services, on-site care, group and individual therapies, and community integration can be replicated at other sites with great success. I want to thank the board, the CAO's office, and everyone involved for your support in making the vision of our community as a wonderful place to live, work, and thrive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's call for speakers who are present here in the chambers. Then we'll move to online. We have speakers uh, who would like to make a comment through Zoom. Thank you. And as a reminder for those joining through Zoom, please use the raise hand icon now and you'll be placed in line to speak. Si se ha unido a través de Zoom, por favor, hace clic en el icono de la mano y estará colocado en la fila para hablar. Chris Cottingham, your microphone is available. Great. Uh, thank you, county staff and all the county supervisors for your consideration for the first Veterans Village in our county. I'm the executive director of the Santa Cruz County Veterans Memorial Building Board of Trustees. We are the 501c3 nonprofit that has operated the Veterans Memorial Building in downtown since 1995 in partnership with the United Veterans Council, as well as the county of Santa Cruz. In early 2020, our partnership evolved as we found ourselves at the beginning of a worldwide pandemic. The Veterans Memorial Building was the first emergency shelter to open and ran for 16 months, sheltering 45 people 24-7. During the pandemic, we began working with the Housing for Health Division and many other great local Santa Cruz organizations to support the rehousing wave program and answer the question of what's next. This included a survey asking over 100 people experiencing homelessness what they needed most to support their journey of transitioning from homelessness to house. We raised tens of thousands of dollars in the community donations and grants and distributed over 100 kits that included first aid kits, solar cell phone chargers, hygiene kits, and many other much needed items of survival. In addition, we helped support movements for over 50 people in the housing, including beds, linens, microwaves, groceries, and other necessities. For the last two years, we have worked with the county side by side to rise up in the face of danger and care for our most vulnerable. This next chapter of our partnership is one of the biggest and most important yet. We are working toward the goal of ending veteran homelessness in this county forever. This project will provide 20 permanent supportive housing units for veterans in this community before the end of the year. This project has inspired new community collaborations between multiple organizations, public, private, and nonprofit to make real change. This grant would empower the veterans of Santa Cruz County to band together and to build their own sustainable community to support their most vulnerable. But this project is also a pilot for a bigger vision of how we can work together to change our community for the better. This will be the first veterans village in our county, but it will not be the last. Thank you. Call in user one, your microphone is available. Is star nine to unmute on a phone? Hi, this is Marilyn Garrett, and I again want to recommend the best selling book, The Real Anthony Fauci, Bill Gates, Big Pharma, and the Global War on Democracy and Public Health by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Children's Health Defense and to read what's said on the back cover of the book. Dr. Joseph Goebbels wrote that, quote, a lie told once remains a lie, but a lie told a thousand times becomes the truth. 
tragically for humanity, there are many, many untruths emanating from Fauci and his minions. RFK Jr. exposes the decades of lies. Luke Montagnier, Nobel laureate, from Tucker Carlson, quote, Bobby Kennedy is one of the bravest and most uncompromisingly honest people I've ever met. Someday he'll get credit for it. In the meantime, read this book, unquote. Next one. Bobby Kennedy's book speaks truth at a time when health care becomes health harm and untruth rules through anti-science and fake news, unquote, from Dr. Vandana Shiva, director of Nabdanya and author of Oneness Versus the One Percent. Mark Crispin Miller, professor of media studies at New York University, quote, the story of Dr. Fauci's rise and reign is actually all about the absolute corruption of our major institutions, government, medicine, academia, and above all, the press by Big Pharma and the Gates Foundation. Those of us who really do believe in science now have this book to help rid the world of that corruption, unquote. Please. Caller 0993, your microphone is available. Second call for caller 0993. It is star nine to unmute. Moving on to Amy Vandenberg. Your microphone is available. Thank you. Good morning. I, I have been helping uh, veterans with employment, homeless veterans with employment for the past six years. And I just want to uh, voice a uh, veteran's um, desire for this a veteran's village. Um, they, they are working but cannot afford uh, to, to live in Santa Cruz. So I uh, just wanted to represent them. Thank you very, for your time. Caller 0993. Oh, this is Gary. Am I on? Yes. Okay. Um, it's too bad the uh, supervisor didn't tell his supporters he was going to keep the two minutes. In fact, I, I find that outrageous. Um, he was attacked by the uh, Panetta machine that said he had anti uh vaccination supporters. I'm reading from the conclusion of a, it's referred to as a Stanford report, but Stanford is doing an arm's length. It's, it's a person that was a fellow at Stanford and the conclusion of 65 reports that's are, are available. It says both medical and non-medical masks are ineffective to block human to human transmission of viral infections such as COVID-19. Wearing fast masks, Face masks have been demonstrated to have substantial adverse psychological and physiological effects, including hypoxia, hypercapnia, uh, shortness of breath, increased acidity and toxicity, uh, aggregation of fear and stress response, rise in stress hormones, immune suppression, fatigue, headaches, decline in cognitive performance, disposition for viral infectious illness, chronic stress, anxiety, and depression. And if anybody looks that information up, uh, uh, be sure you read it. It's been blocked by all the media and the uh, global attempt uh, to call the population. And the people uh, at the uh, uh, Community Foundation are connected with the Community Foundation of Silicon Valley. And uh, it goes back uh, to uh, Stanford and Frederick uh, Terman, who was involved with the Eugenics uh, Record Office. This is about calling the population. Thank you. Thank you. And we will bring you back to the board for item six for action on the consent agenda. Are there any board members who would like to comment on items on consent? Hey, Mr. Chair, I'll start if that's okay. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. 
the first item I just want to, I'll just go in order. Item 23, I appreciate uh, what you and Supervisor Coonerty are doing uh, in the sense of requesting that there be a reduction of taxes at the state level. Um, as you know, this board has discussed this repeatedly about the pressures it puts on the local taxation system from a regulatory standpoint. I don't, however, support the full elimination. It's not something the governor is asking for, the legislature is asking for. So I'm not really sure um, what is what the purpose of full elimination will be. So I'll uh, register a no vote on 23. On item 26, uh, appreciate uh, you and Supervisor McPherson on the remote meeting item. It just makes a lot more sense than the proposal as we currently have it. Um, item 55, just a great appreciation to Stony Brook. It's good to see him uh, back in the board chambers and all the remarkable work that he does on behalf of veterans. I think that this is an exciting project and I look forward to it becoming a reality. Uh, just jumping back to item 41, I'd just like to express my support for the $5 million contribution toward the hospital. This is a very difficult project to uh, make a reality. Senator Laird and our assembly delegation are doing remarkable work at the state level to create the district. We have a very heavy lift here at the local level to try and find funding in a very short amount of time. And this is a uh, very meaningful contribution toward making that happen for Supervisor Caput and myself and those that uh, represents the South County. This is an absolute essential lifeblood hospital that provides, uh, you know, an absolutely necessary services to people, in particular those on Medi-Cal in the South County. And as I know that even those that don't represent the area, the board has been very steadfast in ensuring uh, that this hospital remain open and ideally in a form of public or nonprofit control so that we can ensure that people uh, that generally don't have a voice in the system have a voice. And this seems like a very reasonable investment toward that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, Supervisor McPherson. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd um, also like to uh, comment on a couple items that were referred to by Supervisor uh, Friend. Um, the CAS tax reform, I want to thank the Supervisors Coonerty and Coney for bringing this request back to the board. Um, I've long supported reducing taxes to build a stronger, more competitive cannabis industry here. Um, for that same reason, I can support this request. I understand uh, the consistency of Supervisor Friend and, and opposing it. I understand that. Uh, but to uh, request the state uh, with the hopes that it'll cut back on the illegal cannabis trade, as I think it, it will if we have it more competitive and price-wise. I, too, would like to uh, comment on number uh, 41, the Watsonville Hospital. And it's, uh, the, uh, this is a significant investment by the county. Uh, not just in the future of our South County community, but really the health and well-being of our entire Santa Cruz County. I want to repeat how appreciative I am of CAO Carlos Palacios uh, and the team of staff and community members, including Mimi Hall, our former health services agency director, for working on stabilizing the hospital. Uh, thank you to the dedicated staff at the hospital during this difficult time that we've had with COVID. Without this hospital, our other regional providers would be absolutely overwhelmed um, and our local community uh, members would have to considerable trouble getting the care that they need. Uh, so this is a critical situation that we're in and I'm glad we're taking very aggressive action to uh, see that the Wasserville Hospital uh, continues uh, serving the people of the South County in particular, but the whole Santa Cruz County. Uh, on item number 52, the Housing for Health Board, uh, thank again Supervisors Coonerty and Koenig along with uh, Tiffany Cantrell Warren from the Health Services Agency and our public defender Heather Rogers for being willing to serve on this board. As we know, homelessness is one of uh, the most challenging issues we deal with in government and we must have effective ways in determining how we are going to use our resources and measuring our outcomes. Um, this is critical for the general public to be uh, to be aware of and to see what we are doing and where we're targeting our resources. Um, on item number 55, again, it was nice to see uh, Stony Brook representing the 10,000 plus uh, veterans in our, our community. Thank you once again to our human services department for continuing to support this proposed Veterans Village project at the Timberlane Lodge in Ben Lomond in my district. While it is small in terms of the number of units, this project really does represent a positive solution 
for housing uh, a vulnerable set of community members experiencing homelessness. So thank you and good luck to all. Uh, just a tremendous start. And I hope we have many more, many more um, projects like this Veterans Village uh, at the Timberlane Lodge and, and Ben Loman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a few comments. Um, so I appreciate uh, uh, your work, our work together in item number 23 on the state cannabis tax. The reality is the local governments are the ones uh, who carry the, the burden of enforcement and regulatory matters. Uh, and yet the state uh, collects the tax, uh, the bulk of the tax, and um, it creates challenges for us both maintaining our, our local tax as well as the vibrancy of the, of, of the, of the market uh, and the shift towards uh, the, of the legalized market. Uh, item number 37, which is the holistic advocacy. Uh, it's, a, it's a great new contract from our new public defender taking a new uh, and integrated approach to public defense. Uh, I'd like to add additional direction that um, that in the next six months, uh, she return with a report to the board. Uh, it could just be a, a consent agenda item um, with the outcomes that will be sought uh, in this contract, whether it's recidivism, employment, and housing. And then six months after that, return to the board uh, with the initial data showing um, the, the efficacy uh, of this program. Uh, item number 41, I want to thank uh, the staff uh, for their work on Wattsville Community Hospital um, as the now outgoing board member on the Alliance Board, which provides the Medi-Cal uh, insurance to one quarter of our county residents. It's essential that this hospital remain open and um, and provide excellent care to people, uh, not only in South County, but uh, Medi-Cal members um, who, need, who need access to it and would be medical members countywide would be affected if the hospital uh, ceased to exist. Item number 55, the Vets Village. Um, it was great also to see Stony. It's a great project. I'm very excited uh, for this opportunity. I'm also, I also want to recognize that uh, for a long time, we've asked that uh, homeless services be spread more evenly across the county. Uh, and I appreciate the fifth district um, stepping up to make this uh, transitional housing available for vets um, that provides an important, an important service in our community. And finally, item number 63, which is a grant for a Davenport water uh, tank. Um, Several times in the last seven years, Davenport has uh, needed to have, has run out of water, had their water line severed by first storms and then fire. Uh, this water tank creates more resiliency. And I just want to thank the DPW staff for working hard to get this grant to help this community. Thank you. Uh, if I may, uh, yes, speak. please, Supervisor Cabot. Thank you. Uh, yeah, item 41 uh, has already been mentioned and uh, uh, how critical this is going to be to the whole county uh, because if uh, South County can't handle uh, the people we already have, uh, then it's going to all be shifted to the other hospitals. Uh, it's a critical issue and this is a good start. And item 55, uh, uh, it was a pleasure to go out with uh, Sto uh, Stoney uh, Brooks uh, and see the uh, the area that they're looking at for veterans uh, homeless services. And uh, I think it'll be a great project. Hopefully, uh, we'll, we'll get it done. So anyway, uh, thanks to everybody on the uh, Board of Supervisors and the staff uh, that have been working on this project for quite a while. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's anybody else. Stoney already spoke. I was going to ask him to speak on it. So uh, I don't know if uh, Keith uh, or I'm sorry, Kevin, if uh, Kevin is there to speak on it also. Certainly, if there's a couple members of the public that uh, were waiting for this time to make a comment, go ahead and speak. <laughs> Well, I just want to thank all of the support we're hearing from the board members and from uh, the county team that's uh, led by Dr. Robert Ratner that's been helping us along with this. We're a small organization, but uh, we've been working hard on this and we've uh, gained an incredible amount of community support. 
Uh, we've been working on this for well over a year now. In fact, one of the projects that's up before us was a site that we had looked at early on in our research, and at the time it wasn't available. But we were lucky. We came across Jay's Timber Lane in, in Ben Lomond and found it to be a peaceful, tranquil place that really is a, a great addition to the healing of the veterans who will be able to reside there. And the Home Key Grant, of course, is going to be a major help to us. We will be acquiring the property. We close on February 11th, and we're hoping that the Home Key Funds will help us in to expand the current the current capacity and provide room for more veterans and and uh, really create a community for those folks. The Board of Trustees, uh, you know, we're a small organization, but but we we've, we've really gained a lot of partners in the community with uh, the, both the county and with uh, the community foundation and uh, others. And uh, I, I can't thank everyone enough for all the support we've gotten on this program. Uh, we're really hoping that it's gonna be a great addition to the county and something we can all be proud of. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, supervisors. My name is Keith Collins, and I am working with the Veterans Village Project as well, and I'll be working to oversee uh, the operations of the project. And I first want to start by uh, thanking uh, Supervisor Cabot for coming out and seeing us last Friday and his support of the program, Supervisor McPherson for showing his support, and of course, uh, Supervisor Koenig for supporting us with, as we've been working on this project for about two years now. Uh, and I just want to assure the, the Board of Supervisors that we have a great team put together with experienced developers, uh, operations people like myself, um, support and operations from Jack, who previously just spoke, who's the president of the board, Stoney Brooks, uh, Chris Cottingham. We've put together a great team for this. Um, just want to also add that this is a community project. We we have um, uh, supporting services from people like Great Bears Association. Uh, Front Street will be working with us also to provide supportive services. Some of those services will include drug and alcohol counseling, behavioral and mental health services, on-site case management, uh, and a wellness program and uh, activities uh, for the entire community. So we think this is a great project. We really appreciate your support on this project going forward. And we did recognize there's a long list of items for us to do, and I can assure you that we've either completed or well on our way to getting those done here in the next week. So thank you all. Thank you. Chair Koenig. Chair Koenig. Um, could, um, we had a uh, an issue on the consent agenda with regard to one of these home key projects, uh, specifically 2838 Park Avenue, SoCal. Uh, there was an electronic glitch in the posting of the agenda if you notice, the numbering goes from 53 to 55. For some reason, item 54, um, due to unknown reasons, wasn't actually posted. Uh, this item had to do with um, a loan to the Park Avenue project. And so uh, I'd like to have Suzanne say, get up and explain the item. And then what I'm gonna request is that uh, if the board is willing, to give uh, additional direction, to give me authorization to sign the loan, um, uh, then we could complete this application in a timely fashion. So Suzanne, uh, why don't you go and explain the item and then we'll come back to the board. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair. Uh, I hope you can hear me through the mask. Okay, so we had prepared item 54, which was proposing to provide a pre-development loan using housing uh, low moderate income funds that we have in one of our special revenue funds for these types of uses. It would be a pre-development loan of $101,000 to the entity that is the, uh, the co-applicant for the Park Avenue project. The item was actually visible online if you looked at the link for the full packet so people were able to read the report. It's just in that separate PDF that publishes just the agenda. Somehow it didn't get in that part, but it was visible to the public online. Um, we think a reasonable uh, approach to solve this problem would be that, um, oh goodness, sorry about that, um, would be if you could give additional direction uh, to uh, 
the CAO as part of item, uh, I believe it's 53, is that the right item? Um, to sign a letter indicating that there is a conditional commitment of this loan and this funding to that project and that it will be approved on February 1st as part of the board's agenda on that date. So it would just be a, a conditional commitment letter. The issue is that there's a January 31st deadline right, for the first priority of the home key funds. And that's, that's why we're all trying to get all three of these home key applications approved today. Understood, thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Caput, are you finished with your comments on the consent agenda? Yeah, uh, I'm all finished. Uh, I was uh, Stony uh, Brook. Uh, uh, he spoke on it already, so I was going to make sure that he spoke on item 55. Thank you. Thank you. I have just a few brief comments myself. On item 23, uh, some my, my colleagues have already made comments, but I wanted to add one additional reason to support this item, which is uh, as we see the uh, increased application of fentanyl to all kinds of black market drugs, um, I think it becomes that much more important that we support the legal market for cannabis to ensure that uh, our sons, daughters, friends, uh, do not become victim to this kind of uh, lacing activity that could be fatal. Uh, just in general, I want to acknowledge all the incredible work on the consent agenda, uh, whether it's uh, item 37 for non-attorney advocates, um, item 41, the, the 5 million that uh, for the purchase of Watsonville Hospital, item 42 for healing the streets, uh, item, item 50, 52 for the Housing for Health Board. I mean, I think we're really seeing uh, a sea change in the way that our community approaches uh, health and homelessness, uh, substance use, all the things that uh, go into the situation that um, we all see in one form or another every day. I just want to acknowledge uh, all of uh, the entire community's work. And particularly on items 53 and 55. Uh, back during the first round of home key funding from the state a couple of years ago, I know uh, there are many members of our community who were disappointed that our county did not submit any applications. And so the fact that today we um, are submitting three on top of one that we approved at our last meetings for a total of four for the early round of application uh, for this state funding is really incredible. It's a testament to our Housing for Health Director, Robert Ratner, and Human Services Director, uh, Randy Morris, as well as folks in the planning department for getting all these applications ready. Um, and of course, as has been said, uh, particularly item 55 with the Veterans Village, it's, it's incredible that this project uh, is here before us today. I know just a few months ago, uh, it seemed that it was surviving on a hope and a prayer and that prayer has uh, proven strong. And with over $500,000 contributed from the community at large to make this project happen, the support of the Santa Cruz County Community Foundation and Santa Cruz County Bank. Uh, I know there's a strong team of community members behind this project. and. As has been said, hopefully uh, this is the first of a community-driven model of, to help people recover from homelessness, and we'll see many more in our county in the years to come. And uh, that's all my comments. So with that, uh, a motion would be in order on the consent agenda. I'll, uh, I'll, move. Uh, I'll move or second either way. Well, I, I will with the recommended actions and. Uh, uh, especially on item 54, I think it, um, did, do we need to stipulate that? So my understanding of the, the recommended action that, or the, the additional direction there would be for the CAO to sign a letter with a conditional commitment to make a loan on the, uh, the Park Avenue project. Okay. Additional, dire additional direction on item 53, on, for item 53, got it. And Supervisor Coonerty had additional direction on 37, I believe, Supervisor Coonerty? Correct. So confirming that the motion is for uh, the consent agenda with the additional direction on both 37 and 53. Supervisor McPherson, is that your motion? Yes, yes. Okay. And Supervisor Caput, you're seconding that? That'll be fine. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Motion by Supervisor McPherson, second by Supervisor Caput. Please call the roll. Thank you, and I'll be calling two um, roll call votes to capture Supervisor Friend's no vote on item 23. This is for items 
12 through 64.1. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Honig? Aye. Thank you. Now for motion item 23. Supervisor Friend? No. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Yes. McPherson? Yeah, aye. Honig? Aye. Thank you. Uh, both of those motions pass. Um, we'll now proceed to uh, our regular agenda and item number seven to consider an update on county strategic initiatives, including the first biannual progress report on the 2021-2023 operational plan, integration of the 2022-2023 proposed budget, redesign of Primo process improvement and release of new performance measurements and dashboards and direct the county administrative office to return on August 23rd, 2022 with the next update as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. And Nicole Cor Col Coburn, our assistant county administrative officer, I believe you'll be leaving the presentation. Thank you, Chair Koenig and good morning members of the board. I'm Nicole Coburn. I'm one of the assistant CAOs. I'm joined today by Elisa Benson, the other assistant CAO, along with Sven Stafford, uh, a principal analyst in our office. He's currently online and will be driving the presentation. Sheriff Hart is also joining us, as well as Carolyn Burke from the planning department. Together, we're going to be providing a combined county strategic initiatives update to the board. Um, this is our first combined update, and we're going to be um, getting into more of all of our initiatives. Next slide. So uh, the agenda for this morning, um, as I mentioned, this is the purpose is to provide an integrated combined update and show the interconnectedness of our various management initiatives. Um, one of the critical steps that we're working on right now is integrating our budget more into our various initiatives, and we're going to be discussing how we're doing that. Um, the operational plan that we're currently in is for the two-year period of 2021 through 2023, and one of the focuses of this operational plan is on equity and how performance measurement and data disaggregation is supporting that focus, and Sven is going to be talking more about that. And then we're going to turn it over to um, Elisa Benson, um, who's going to be giving a primo update and talking about how better measurement supports building a continuous improvement mindset for the county that leads to uh, continual improvements. Next slide. So this, this graphic should look familiar to you. Um, it's how we've chosen to display the connectedness between our various strategic initiatives. Um, as the board is aware, uh, you adopted a vision for the future for our county several years ago in 2018. Um, that's a six-year strategic plan, and that connects to our other initiatives. So the CAO and departments are working together to achieve that vision. We have performance measurement. Um, that is asking four critical questions about how much the county is doing, how well we're doing it, are we making, are we making a difference, and is anyone better off? And we're using that initiative um, to disaggregate data so we can ask better questions in each of those areas. Um, and more interesting questions as well. We also have PRIMO, Continuous Process Improvement, which is a system for taking those questions and developing better solutions on a continuous basis. We have our operational plan that's aligning our solutions and major work with our strategic plan goals. And then um, program budgeting, which you see there, is the, the method for financing our major work and trying to accomplish our goals and integrate that with all of our initiatives as well. Next slide. So in terms of uh, our budget integration, we are working on um, an online, new online budget as part of our OpenGov implementation. Um, we're trying to uh, integrate the budget with our strategic plan website, which is at SCC, um, www.scc vision.us. 
um, we're trying to have more explicit ties between the financing and the budget and our operational plan objectives and providing much more detail online than you currently see in our proposed budget document. Um, we are also working on uh, showing the budget more at a program level with that greater detail. Uh, we've been working with departments to generate functions so that there is um, a much more um, more granular level information and ties more specifically to everything that the county is doing. We're going to be publishing uh, the budget online, but also making some print options available, which we understand, you know, departments and the board need to see in, in different ways, but generally making the document more accessible and easy to navigate by having it in an online format. And then lastly, um, by providing the budget online, we're going to be reducing printing and providing an eco-friendly option. Um, and so now I would like to turn to Sven, who's going to be going more into detail on our operational plan um, and some of the accomplishments we've made over the last six months, as well as provide an equity update. Thanks. And thanks, Nicole. Good morning, board. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the presentation here. So, um, as the as the board will recall, we adopted the uh, 2021 to 23 operational plan back in September uh, with 180 objectives. Uh, within that plan, there was a focus on on equity uh, that included 80 objectives. Um, within those 80. The, in the December update, we've completed seven, uh, amended 12, and 61 are in progress and on time. Um, and now I'm going to uh, request that I be able to share my screen so we can jump to the, uh, the operational plan website uh, to give you all a little tour of what's published. So here on the operational plan website, you can see our total at the top of 180 objectives uh, that we've completed 16 total. Ben, we can't see your screen. Uh -oh. Sorry, Sven, I need to move the secondary screen. Okay. Now you can share. <laughs> there we go. Excellent. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, so now you can see that we have uh, 180 total objectives that 16 have been complete. Uh, 37 are amended, uh, all due to um, timeline adjustments, uh, pushing the completion date out, and 127 are, are in progress and on time. Um, up here, you can still sort, uh, sort the objectives by completion status, by when they're due, and um, and here in the different um, in the various equity buckets that we have. Uh, so, for example, um, we have under communications and education our redistricting process that was completed. Uh, again, all the completed objectives have a verification link and documentation. So, if you click on that, it takes you to to the redistricting site. Um, if we're back here. And looking under county services, we have uh, the Agents of Discovery, which is a, uh, a parks project uh, for a mobile app to encourage um, youth to use augmented reality to be active in their communities. And so, again, the link takes you to the, to the app where you can explore and get set up there. Um, and then one equity objective that we that we want to highlight also is a new uh, public facing transparency dashboard for the sheriff coroner. And so I am going to uh, invite Sheriff Hart to come uh, come on and help us uh, help us give you a tour of, of that work. Great. Thank you, Sven. Good morning, board. Jim Hart, Sheriff Coroner. And as your sheriff, I've been committed to transparency and data sharing and the data that you're going to see today. Uh, has been public information for a number of years through our monthly reports that's been posted on our website but this new dashboard makes it much more easily accessible to the public and today we just want to give you a brief preview of what is in the dashboard the main page shows the crime rate and how santa cruz county compares with the rest of the state 
Users will also be able to compare with local jurisdictions like the city of Santa Cruz or the city of Watsonville, and also compare against neighboring counties such as Monterey. Users will be able to compare different crime types such as property crime, and then dig even deeper into subsets like vehicle theft or grand theft. This dashboard has a lot of great data uh, through our partnership with our dispatch center, Netcom, with one example being stop data. Sheriff's deputies take part in bias training to ensure that they are carrying out their duties fairly and impartially. And in the chart, here the colored bars represent the percentage of stops and the black lines represent the population. You can see that the chart and the stop data is close to the actual census data. We can also look at this data over time to better see trends and identify where we might want to adjust our training. I'd like to thank our crime analyst, Josh Pastor, for his work on this subject. And we look forward to hearing feedback on the dashboard and improving it over time to deepen our community partnerships and commitment to keeping Santa Cruz County safe. Back to Sven. Thank you, Sheriff. Um, we'll also be previewing uh, later in the in the presentation uh, a dashboard from the Planning Permit Center. Um, with both of these dashboards, our intention is to have them up and live and available to the public by the end of this month. So by you know mid next week, um, and uh, we'll get a tour of the of the planning dashboard later. And now I'd like to transition to uh, Elisa Benson to talk about Primo. Great, thank you, Sven. Uh, good morning, everyone. Elisa Benson, ACAO, and I'll be speaking about our Primo continuous process improvement work. Uh, it, one, thank you, Sheriff, for just demonstrating what how amazing data visualization, um, how just the same data but put forward in a different way helps people ask different questions. And I just want to draw everyone's attention to that that center circle of our strategic management initiatives around data, that that is really the platform that is driving and unifying this work. And we've spent the last four years sort of developing the pieces and we're now at a place where, where we're trying to bring them together. So, uh, and sort of how those those different parts which feel a little bit distinct are actually unified and when you you can see the alignment with them. So through the use of data, we're really able to art articulate those desired results and have tools and, and data collection systems and conversation practices to have our staff and our managers engage with the work more specifically. And how performance the performance measurement initiative has really linked to Primo is, is by creating new dashboards it's make it, that's where we get the continuous part of, of the work. And I want to just remind the board and the watching public, the Primo goal was to really create a common culture of improvement that's centered on customers, driven by employees, and focuses on measurable outcomes. So what does that mean in continuous process improvement? It really means making data visual, accessible, and usable. So you start with understanding your process and being able to uh, um, characterize it. And then you don't just stop there. You have to have that shared practice and a learning mindset. Um, Primo Pi, you know, did some great work bringing in employees together and, and then making some process, some process improvements along the way, but getting that baseline set of information to measure the effect and create a, create a culture and a practice around um, continued review, you need to have that data dashboard. Um, so, I'm going to pass it to Carolyn Burke, and we're going to be that we'll be previewing this is the public facing dashboard that's going to be very, very important as the county moves forward on the Unified Permit Center. And it really provides a, a place, an invitation for curiosity for staff, the public to understand how things are working and how things can uh, work better. So thank you to Sven for working with the planning team to develop this. And it's it's really how you make things go from one-offs to continuous. Take it away, Carolyn. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Good morning, my name is Carolyn Burke, Senior Civil Engineer in Planning and Project Manager for the Unified Permit Center. We're excited to release the Permit Center dashboard and provide new insight in the, into the work of our dedicated planning department staff. 
We're proud to highlight the quantity of work we can produce with finite staffing, over 2,000 permits in the last 12 months, and look forward to continuing to develop the dashboard to provide the public with more content and context regarding the overall permit process. We can start our tour by looking at the building permit dashboard, which provides information on both the volume and cumulative time from building permit application to issuance. The data you see is still in the validation phase and should be considered preliminary until a public release later this month. If we dig into the building permit dashboard, you'll see that there are a lot of excellent ways to break down the median 32 days it takes from application intake to permit issuance. If we dig, uh, sorry, <laughs> first you can see that about 75% of that time, the application is under county review, and one quarter of those days are clients responding to comments on building plans. This figure is an aggregate of all permit review types. To find figures for individual review times, we can click on the bar chart icon to view medium permit review times by the type of permit being requested. If we move to the line chart option, we see median approval times over the last year, and users can sort that by permit type as well if they wanted to focus on, for example, ADUs. Finally, if we click on the map, we can compare approval times in different zip codes throughout the county and may note, for example, that ADU approvals take longer in general up in the mountains where there may be more complicated environmental and safety requirements. There's a lot more data to explore and I encourage everyone to go to the website and look around when it goes live next week. The intention of the dashboard is to help the public ask better questions and show the public the wide variety of permits we issue and what they may expect in terms of cumulative review times. Well, there is a lot of variability in permit review times depending on type of permit and individual circumstances. We are focused on providing improved client tools to help our customers develop complete application packages and reduce approval times. We look forward to working with people who use our systems to make improvements as we learn from each other. I'd also like to thank planning staff members Annette Olson, Amy Wilbanks, and Brian Ruman from our office for their work helping to put this together, as well as Sven for his guidance and initiative in creating this amazing tool for the department and our community. And now I'll pass it back to Lisa. Thank you, Carolyn. Again, this is the kind of work that really takes the concepts and puts gives us the ability to put them into practice. Yes, yeah, thank you. So just very quickly, we today in our update, we wanted to really give the give us some time to explore how these things, how our initiatives are supporting each other. With that said, I wanted to give a brief update on uh, our progress in terms of what we're calling Primo 2.0, a redesign and reboot. And really given the continuing demands of the pandemic and the recovery, we've been very, very mindful of the load um, the load that, that, that the county staff is, is carrying right now and how do we rede redesign our, our approach to continuous process and improvement um, in a way that's mindful of that and it's scaled. So we've been spending the last six months following up on the, the redesign topics that we, and we shared with the board back in June. And really that's focused with, along with our green belts, that's really focused on that question of using data measuring and those conversations around data. So we've made strong progress in developing those base, a basic tool for very straightforward, simple DIY project documentation, because we found coming out of year one that just getting those baseline measurements was, was challenging for people. So that's one of the key points we're working on today. And we're also recrafting the workshop curriculum for both practitioners and managers. And we have a solid draft of that as, as referenced in our memo. And we'll be now taking that draft with a select group of departments to sort of work through and make sure this curriculum works here in our organization. And we're gearing up for prototyping our, our new approach to complex project, uh, lean project work through these 12 week more tightly tightly constrained uh, improvement improvement uh, prints as we're calling them. So that's underway, and as mentioned in the memo, uh, where we're, we're, we will plan to get those things up and rolling and for for broader county use uh, later in the summer. 
So with that, I wanna just come back to that idea what we were doing differently today. And that was really focusing on how performance measurement and use of data is, is the connective tissue between the parts of our strategic initiatives. And we've, we can now have that infrastructure in place to start practicing, learning by doing, using the data differently. And if we, um, are, if we use that data differently and we, uh, add a, and we can really look at what we're honestly achieving, are we meeting those results that the board and the public expect of us and how do we, if we're not meeting them, how do we move forward? And if we disaggregate the data, we're able to examine if those results are inclusive and equitable. So all of this is as a change, it's a change of practice and it's gonna require, you know, tools and different resources. And we really, we really appreciate what the board has done in supporting us in this journey. So we uh, will be coming back to the board with another report uh, in August and we, We'll turn this to the board for questions and, and then just action our, our recommended actions of filing the report and then that coming back in August. But happy to take any questions on any part of the presentation today. Thank you for that excellent presentation. Other questions from members of the board? Yes, Mr. Chair, I do have a question. First, uh, a note of appreciation for uh, what went from concept to something much grander than concept and not that much time as far as really getting this transparency portal out, uh, et cetera. But I did have a, a question in just regards to, and Ms. Benson alluded to it, but I was hoping to maybe get a very specific concrete example to understand the process. So um, Ms. Burke's presentation kind of went through, for example, planning and timelines and, and the amount of time it takes for an ADU, for example. And, and so I think that somebody may look at that and, and have some concerns about the timeline associated with how long it takes. But once we have the data out there, just so I can understand internally, say in the planning department, how is that data used specifically to change processes in order to adjust it? Or are we making a determination that it's not a concern based on however X number of days, where's the cutoff that's an acceptable amount of days. So just sort of the decision matrix in regarding to whether something is deemed an issue, and if it is an issue, then how it's actually modified moving forward. Hey, supervisor friend. Um, yeah, we see this tool as being used internally to track our ongoing um, successes as we implement process improvements. And these uh, dashboards can also be updated to include goal times so that we can look at our performance relative to a commonly held goal um, projection. And as we, as we move through um, over time, we can also track um, over time in the line charts, we can also include you know, vertical lines when we implement different process improvements so that we can see how those have impacted our overall review times. Okay, Ms. Burke, well, thank, I mean, as always, you always have an outstanding answer for these questions. My, my follow to that then is, is that part of say the 2.0 process of this? I mean, I think that, that we've done the transparency part, which was obviously setting the foundation. Um, realistically, now it's gonna be taking a look across the systems. I mean, people already know internally. I mean, you're the ones who really inform this process that way. You're the, you're on the ground, but, but just uh, since we are gonna be looking at comparators for reductions, I mean, one of this was also saying in the last two years or in the two years following, we were able to reduce times. And, and I'm not definitely not trying to specifically call out planning and this, it just happened to be that that was part of the presentation and the dates are very clear, right? And that, but that we've reduced X times by 25%. These are part of the other second part of what we do in regards to this report. I was just wondering when or how that, that happens now in this process, because now we've got this information. It's actually exceptionally useful information because there's a, there's a sense in the community about things, but now we've got data to actually answer the sense. But now I think, um, I mean, we may very well make a determination that these are acceptable timelines. I just want to know how that decision's made and and then when in this process this is going to be made. Absolutely. Um, so so one of the things that um, I'm eternally grateful to spend for is um, 
his uh, brilliance in, in being able to help take um, what we input into our permit tracking system, which is INFOR, and be able to translate that into some graphical tools that we can use moving forward. And this really establishes the baseline for what our um, further process improvements are. I think that there are incremental process improvements that we can work towards as we implement different process improvements on our internal side. Um, we hope to be able to implement a green lining program, um, hopefully in the next month or so, that will allow us to um, include notes on plans to move them through the process sooner. Those are certain things that we can then track over time and see what type of impact that's having. And then we um, absolutely will uh, take a look at what our objective realities are as far as what goals we can um, set forth for review times moving forward. This is the first step though, is establishing the baseline so that we have something to measure it off of. Um, we will also have internal dashboards that have different functionalities as well so that we can look at individual sections, uh, performance and such if we're doing um, smaller, uh, not full uh, department-wide uh, process improvements. If I could, can I add please. Please. Oh, thank you. So I just wanted to I appreciate that, Carolyn. And I think one thing that's important to, to note here is from a lean continuous process improvement perspective, that focus on those those workflows, those processes within planning, and then within you know our, our new approach to this work, those changes need to stem from that management and staff's focus on on that baseline. It's not the primo office changing the target for them. What we want to be able to do is they have that data to reflect on, be curious about, ask questions about. They need someone to come in and help work through a specific process redesign. We want to be, give them those resources and tools and maybe that outside perspective. But again, the idea here is it's coming from the workplace that they are confident in the data that they're seeing and they have the space and time to have those honest conversations about what's working, what's not, why are certain things taking longer, why do certain things go faster? And that's that learning mindset and having the time to do that. And really having that visible process that sort of holds everyone accountable. Um, and it's something that people all agree is credible is where you start that dialogue. So this is where it starts, but it's also the practice now. Sven's you know, been working with departments over the last year, 18 months to develop dashboards. Now, what do we do with them? That's the question. That's the next sort of part of our journey as an organization is now we actually need to take these tools on a regular basis and engage with them. Mm -hmm. So that's part of where we want to go. And it's a, I think everyone's being brave and a little nervous, but we're stepping forward. And I remember when we first brought Primo to this, to this board in 2018, we recognized this, this feels a little risky for us. And what we heard from all of you was like, we know, but we want you guys to keep moving. And, and, and I think these tools that are starting to mature, we're at a place where we can take the next, take a big breath and take a next step and move forward. Yeah, and I appreciate that context from both you, Ms. Benson, as well as Ms. Burke. I mean, I, I view this as we, we now have a way to quantify the problems. And also, by the way, to quantify where there aren't problems, even if there might be a perception of where they exist, equally important. I guess my, I still haven't, maybe satisfactorily, and this is just my, I'm not probably communicating this well. I just want to see where the next step is going to happen. I mean, everybody's there. I'm in agreement that it should be driven by the department and the experts within the department. It shouldn't be a top-down situation. But are we talking about at the next update we're going to be moving towards? I mean, what I'm looking for is sort of the concrete steps of now how we effectuate change as a result of this transparency and data. That's ultimately the data simply inform where we do or do not have issues um, and where departments now uh, I think then have to have a transparent discussion with the board about, well, I mean, I could reduce this to whatever, but it's going to take X number of staff, for example, or, or some sort of technological advance, but, but whatever that we're on that, that's where our role would come in. We're on a policy and budgetary uh, side, more of a macro than a micro, but 
if we're all on the same page that this is the framework, then I'm just saying that now that I've built the foundation or you've built the foundation, the team's built the foundation, when are you going to start building the walls, right? I mean, when is the next step going to come in that actually means that we've moved that toward? That's what I was hoping to, uh, and maybe perhaps wasn't communicating very, very well about when the next step would come that way. Do you want to? Oh, no, go ahead, Carol. Okay. Um, yeah, well, so um, we have a series of process improvements that we're currently looking at in house. We'll be reviewing those um, compared to these uh, data, the, the data that we have available at this time. And we will be looking to. Um, maximize our efficiency. So if if you look at that data, you'll also see that the total number of uh, building plan check staff is five that are reviewing the 2200 permits. So we will absolutely be looking at our capacity issues in that respect. We have other um, studies underway in the planning department to look at our throughput for building plan check. And the reason why we're focused on building plan check is that for building permits, they touch almost every building permit. Well, they do touch every building permit that comes through. So they can be a constraining factor. So we're absolutely looking at this in combination with what we have um, in our offices. And we hope to actually uh, continue to improve the dashboard to include other figures such as that so that people can understand what the process is and then project reasonable estimates giving our given our staffing resources so that we can um, be able to be transparent and realistic with what we have available. Thank you. I, I apologize for monopolizing so much time. I appreciate that this is a continuing discussion and, uh, and I'll uh, hand it back to you, Mr. Chair, for my colleagues to ask additional questions. Thank you. Other questions from members of the board? Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Chair I'd just like to make a few comments. Uh, good questions and uh, I appreciate the answers. Um, but since this board has um, approved the county's first strategic plan, as was mentioned in 2018, I've brought the process developed as we all have in hopes the county operations and service from our community uh, would, would see a demonstrable uh, improvement. And now that we have ex experienced this and the data from the past three years, three years, I can say with confidence, the county is not only improving our performance, but we're doing so in a transparent way, which is critical. Uh, the next step to identify and speak to the county's commitment to carry on with this, to increase efficiency. And I'm especially pleased about the two dashboards that we uh, had up, uh, one from public safety, thanks to Sheriff uh, Hart, and one for uh, the planning department serving the community. Uh, the credit for this tremendous work is a direct result of a strong support from, of the CAO, Carlos Palacios, and the county executive team that's before us today, and also all the workers who have committed to make county work better. And I'm truly appreciative of that because we want to serve the county in the best way we can. One question I have with particularly as it pertains to planning and probably public works operations with a CZU fire uh, in the middle of all this um, how and four leaf taking over how has that has that um, adjusted our expectations or the time frame that we want to do some of these things um, I'm just curious to know what the impact of the CZU fire had with what almost a thousand nine hundred and fifty structures that were destroyed Absolutely. Um, so, so you're saying how does that impact the overall timeline for more broad planning wide process improvements? Yes. Yes. Um, so, so we will have uh, data for the CZU fire also available on the building permit dashboard. Um, that's just a side note. We're still working, working on that data. Uh, luckily, with the ability to have the recovery permit center staffed with four leaf staff, um, it has allowed us to um, our building plan checking staff um, that I was just uh, noting to supervisor friend that they can continue to focus on planning department work. Um, so it shouldn't impact anything in, in that respect. Probably the largest impact it has on our staff is in our geologic uh, review section who continues to interface with the uh, geohazard clearances for the CZU fire process. I will say that um, that our processing of permits, the, the process that we've set up for the CZU permits 
um, with the clearances ahead of the building permit um, application has been successful in many regards. And we're actually looking at how we can implement something similar in our uh, building permit process for more complex projects. Um, and so in that respect, it's actually had a positive influence on our overall trajectory of where we want to go with the uh, Unified Permit Center and some of our streamlining options. Um, so overall, we don't anticipate a significant impact on, on process improvements from our processing of CZU applications. Well, thank you. And again, congratulations to the whole team and county st staff who participated. I think it's really critical that they have input because there's the, they're the ones that see the public day in and day out. So thank you for everything that's uh, progressed to this point. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yep, uh, Supervisor Kennedy. Chair, yeah, sort of questions, comment. I'd like to get the response, which is, uh, so but I think, as everyone said, I think the transparency is fantastic. And now county processes are just so much more visible uh, to the public in an easier, more accessible way. And I want to acknowledge that <coughs> that transparency is both... Um, uh, you know, challenging and can be a little bit scary. And it's also been done in the context of COVID and fires and uh, number of economic challenges and beyond. And so uh, credit to staff for really moving this forward. I want to um, make two comments, which is, and I think they sort of piggyback on Supervisor Friend's comments, which is uh, a couple of the objectives, it's starting to feel like a couple of the objectives have moved from community impact objectives to more like departmental to-do lists, submit a plan, assess this. And that's, you know, if I'm a member of the community, I want to know, are we reducing greenhouse gases? Are we reducing, are we filling potholes? Are we reducing crime? Are we, you know, what's the recidivism rate? Like th those are the things that I think the community wants to focus on and wants to be able to track and, you know, like the public safety dashboard that sort of shows crime rising and falling vis-a-vis -vis the state or other counties or uh, the cities within our county helps do that. I think what we're looking for as policy makers is uh, an, an ability for the public through the board to be able to weigh in on setting these objectives. How much are we reducing our carbon emission standards by when? Uh, and then, um, and then also to sort of talk about, uh, talk about Ms. Burke's, uh, comments is, so how, what, what do we need to allocate more resources to, to, to do just because there's a the limit on resources or staffing is limiting the outcome we want as a community versus what do we want to get into the business of, and what do we want to get out of the business of? Are there ways to, from a policy point of view, to just simplify it? Um, so that so that fewer hands are even touching an application or they're deemed approved uh, before. Uh, I think I talked about with solar, is there a way to certify solar installers so that we then just go back and if you're certified, we just do a spot check on 10% of the solar panels installed as a way to not say we're asking the same staff to just move it through quicker, but we're actually looking at an entirely different way of processing an application. Um, and I think, I think the transparency helps form that and the culture shifts and the conversations. Uh, but I think we need to be able to integrate the allocation of resources um, and policy objectives better and understand that you know, in a world of limited resources, we're only going to be able to focus on a few objectives, but we want to move the objectives forward that the, that the community is interested in, in seeing addressed, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And we're um, currently with development of the Unified Permit Center. We are looking at staffing resources because we are looking at increasing our uh, presence and our availability to the public in a pre-application phase when um, folks can come into the counter and be able to um, get more information and have more comprehensive review packages. Um, I will say that we are also, um, as I mentioned before, we're looking at uh, Im implementing a pre-application clearance similar to what we've implemented in the CZU fires. 
um, to be able to remove things entirely from the review queue if we can um, perform a short preliminary review prior to putting it into those um, routing queues, then that removes it, um, you know, it, it will have a direct impact on overall uh, review time. Um, also, there's been certain uh, streamlining um, measures taken in the CZU applications, such as, um, you know, deferment of, of review of certain uh, technical reports um, that may only need to be um, used for compliance with the California Building Code. We're also looking at how we can reduce the number of those traveling through our system by, um, you know, just simply reducing the overall number of reviews. And those are the methods that we're, we're hoping to employ to do that. So absolutely, uh, Supervisor Kunodri, we, we are sharing, share your sentiment. Yeah, and, and, and by the way, and let me just say, I think um, through the four leaf contract and through these initiatives, I mean, planning is getting asked these questions because you're brave enough to show up today. Um, but, I, but I'm sort of across the county and the other departments, uh, it's, I think I'm, I'm trying to make the broader point, not just about planning, but about the other departments of when we say we're gonna move records online, great, but then how many, what does that translate to in terms of the overall number of customers who come in and request records? Are we trying to get 40% of them to be accessed online or 30% or what's the growth rate over time? What's the savings to the county? So it's just trying to like um, uh, make sure that when we're setting these objectives that they're customer focused and community focused and not internally fo process focused. Supervisor Coonerty, this is Nicole. You know, I think we've made great progress in moving in that direction with the current two-year operational plan and with the training that we're going to be developing and working with departments this spring throughout, you know, into the next fiscal year, especially as we're working on developing the next two-year plan for the next two-year period. We're hoping that objectives, you know, contain measures and targets across all the departments and you're seeing much more of that. It's been a real learning process for some departments where this is the first time they've ever worked on SMART objectives. But I think that, you know, departments are beginning to better understand what those mean and to set those. And so we agree and we'll be moving, you know, working with them to try to see more of that across the county. If I could add one more thing to that, and we really appreciate hearing this this feedback and perspective from all of you on these moving pieces and where we go from here. I mean, yes, we're, we're working with departments to develop new practices, but so are we. How do we integrate in our role of bringing information together and engaging with our departments about what's happening? These tools are for us to use and sort of test and try as well as our regular new business practices. So I think I find it really helpful getting that feedback. And so as we start thinking about what do we do differently and what questions do we do differently from you know, the CAO's office to support, support those practices by departments and what is our role in that? I don't have the uh, Pat, here's the five things answer for you right now, but this makes me think about, okay, what do we need to do? And what are those steps and how we're going to go be proceeding on that maturity model of changing how we engage around these different pieces of the management initiatives. So I don't have a good answer yet, but we'll have a better one in August. You're on mute, Supervisor Coonerty. Sorry, I just want to say I appreciate that and I recognize that all of us are trying to continuously improve. And so uh, it's these conversations that um, that help move move it forward. Thank you. Any further que questions? I'll just say uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your report. Uh, we've gone through... Uh, some very difficult times and uh, uh, we're doing the best we can and you're doing the best you can uh, to keep the public uh, involved and uh, that we're available and we're actually you know working on every project that we can um, 
you're doing a great job. So I, I appreciate the transparency and also uh, letting the public know that we are doing everything we can. Thank you. I just have a few questions myself. Uh, the first is, who would you say is the target audience for these dashboards? I, I, you know, uh, Chair Koenig, I would say that it's a combination of uh, the public. You know, we're hoping the public can learn more about what the county is doing. Um, but also departments, you know, we really want to encourage them to be looking at the information and like Carolyn described, trying to set goals and targets and uh, improvements uh, on a continuous basis to um, see how department operations might be improved. Right, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, so I guess just some feedback on that point, um, you know, I see the interface kind of struggling right now between being trying, you know, being accessible to as many people as possible, um, and then also providing some very rich and meaningful data. Um, I think, given the ultimate fact that the people using it the most are likely to either be uh, internal members of the county in departments, as you said, or uh, perhaps policy experts working for um, organizations on our community. Um, I think it would be okay uh, you know, not to be afraid of the data and to, to bring that forward a little bit more. I mean, some, some of the interfaces, for example, um, you know, half of the, the data presentation is devoted to an explainer. Um, so I, I think just let the data shine a little bit more. And um, as you said, that's ultimately, it's, you know, the explaining piece um, can always I mean, in many ways, that's our roles as supervisors is to ex take this data and put it, explain it in a simple way to the public that uh, people can understand. And I think that's true of um, you know, leaders of other organizations as well and department heads. Um, the next question is, what is the process for getting feedback on these dashboards within the departments? That's probably a good question for Sven. Um, yeah, we have a... I mean, we, we do have a, an email set up to, for the public to provide uh, feedback. We did, and with operational plan objectives, there's a link on each objective. If the public wishes to provide feedback on any, any given operational objective, they can just click the link and it takes them to a form, you know, two, three field form to submit uh, that, that generates a comment to us. Um, and so, you know that's those are the those are the main ways to to provide feedback and interact right now, uh, and we'd certainly be open to uh, to other ideas. And as far as getting feedback from uh, folks in the different departments, is that something that'll happen? Is it does it happen now? Is it part of the primo process, it, or is it currently happening? Yeah, I know with with the existing data that we've done, we have. Uh, you know, we do have periodic check-ins uh, just to look at the, you know, make sure the, the data is up to date and, and refreshing properly and, uh, and that it's still, it's still useful uh, and, and accurate. So we do have that. We have uh, ongoing, you know, ongoing trainings that we, that we do with departments and department staff who are actually writing the objectives and doing the, the dashboards. So that's, um, that's something that we're, you know, continuously trying to, trying to improve. Can I add one thing to that? I mean, when, when Sven and the team work with a department on building a dashboard, it's with the department. Mm -hmm. So that original construction is absolutely a collaborative effort where we do have some of the specific data presentation visualization um, expertise that does reside in the CAO's office. There are also plenty of pockets of that in our departments, but that create initial creation of the dashboard is absolutely a, a shared, a shared effort. So it's, you know, we're not taking their data and going in a corner and coming up with something there. It's trying to come up with a, a framework that's going to be meaningful both to their customers if they're public facing, but also helpful from an operations standpoint. So it's a co-designed dashboard. That's that's great. I mean, obviously we want it to continue to evolve and that's only going to happen if people are engaged. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that's happening from the beginning. Um, and then I just want to, you know, 
emphasize a point you brought up, which is you know, having these dashboards is, is fantastic. Um, you know, certainly, we, as was mentioned today, there's always tens, if not hundreds of items on our consent agenda. And, uh, you know, just the, the funding streams and the way all these programs work in the county, it's very difficult to keep track of. And so having this, uh, you, you know, you, you don't know if you're moving the needle unless you have a needle. And this is really, uh, you know, the provides that needle and provides a measurement system for our, our county, which has been lacking. And um, it's good that we'll be able to have it going forward. Um, but of course, the ultimate uh, piece of this is not just the measurement, but also the culture behind it, as you said. And I think you know those two questions you mentioned are: Are we doing things that make a difference? Are we doing things that matter? Is anyone better off? I think it's important that we establish in county culture that we we all ask that question of the things we're doing every day, um, and then you know look at the data and see how that it interacts with uh, you know our own perception of of how our job is going and if we're working on something that matters. Um, because ultimately it's that engagement from everyone doing the work day to day that's that's going to make a difference and you know we're, we talk a lot about lean principles and um you know one of the main ones is continuous improvement driven from every suggestions uh from people doing the work every day long so um i just would you know use the opportunity to encourage everyone to ask those questions uh, are we doing work that matters and that makes people's lives better off um, and finally, uh, who in the past has participated from the Board of Supervisors office directly in the Primo trainings? I don't, I think we actually may have had the analyst for the board be part of the trainings. I know Jillian was originally part of it when she was in that role, but as we move forward, we're happy to have conversations about, about how to include representation from the board offices. Okay, great. Yeah, I want to make sure that uh, we'll follow up. we're all on the same page. Absolutely. Thank you. We'll not take it to public comment on this item. Does any member of the public speak? Yes, please approach. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I went to all the meetings when this first began back in 2018, and a lot of people did, and we put sticky bot dots on things. So it's, it's interesting to see that finally something may be coming that will really produce some change. And I really like that it can be, and hopefully it will be integrated with the budget process. Uh, we need a lot better transparency on um, public works budget, certainly county fire budget. You know, the type one engines that have just been purchased are out stuck in the mud. Was that really a good thing to do? I don't think so. So I also want to thank the supervisors for your good questions, um, particularly how does the public weigh in on this? This data is, is good to have out and uh, it is supposed to be for public uh, improvement of processes, but, but I, I don't think just having an email link is, is enough. I think there needs to be more interaction with the public on this. You know, for example, on the, the planning department, it was shown the median day is 32 days, but yet the bar graph showed it was more like 150 days. And I'm hearing, I appreciate Supervisor McPherson's questions relative to the CZU fire. I'm hearing those people are screaming <laughs> because it's such a mess. And their, their constant comment is the planning department is out of control. Um, why does someone who built a house in 2000 have to have a complete remake of their septic system when they had everything um, to code back in 2000? Um, I, I want to say in terms of public input and involvement, one good thing would be addressing that I only get two minutes. People here coming in only get two I want minutes. to actually say that since we are uh, speaking on a specific item uh, and we don't have a huge crowd today on, to speak on this particular item, you may have an additional minute. Well, thank you. With me, anyone speaking on this item? Thank you very much. It's gracious of you, and I appreciate that. So um, allowing during general public comment time, I mean, we, we are relegated only to two minutes. Thank you for the additional minute here to speak on everything on the consent agenda and closed session and anything that we can't stay for the whole amount. I would like to ask that one thing that could happen would be that you could reinstitute the citizen's ability to pull a consent agenda item. We used to be able to do that. That was taken away from us. 
So important things on the consent agenda could be given more time like the hospital on which every single supervisor spoke today. So um, that's that's one thing. And, and I want to hear from staff, those in the trenches. I have heard uh, the, direct, the steward, shop steward for the union come and really say that this primo process is stupid. <laughs> They've got a lot of work and here's this this process that is putting more demands on them and he actually called it stupid. Um, I really appreciate uh, Supervisor Coonerty's uh, bringing it back that this needs to have a customer focus, not just um, a to-do list for staff and that working together will work, will improve things. And I'm confident we will. And I wanna see how we'll be tied in with the budget. And uh, I wanna thank Supervisor Friend for his persistence in trying to get some more objective answers on goal setting. Thank you. Thank you for the extra time. Thank you. Is there anyone on Zoom who'd like to make a yes. comment? There's one caller, caller two, your microphone is available. Star nine to mute if you're calling in. This is Marilyn Garrett listening to the whole thing on my landline here. Um, and I'd like to um, say I agree totally with Becky. I, I was the same point. You talk about equity, certain words, and quantifying problems. Um, equity. We used to have three minutes to speak during public comment and on every consent agenda item. You members of the board all comment on consent agenda items, but not members of the public who are muscled from doing that. That's not equity in any sense of it. I hear you refer to customers we are not customers. We are members of the public who fund your supervisorial pay. So refer to members of the public. Also, you're talking about transparency, but there's transparency omitted on certain topics, like you, um, all the microwave sources. And personally, it's very painful for me at the Board of Supervisors Chambers because on the roof of the building are all these radiation emitting devices and antennas and a 5G um, uh, on a pole right out there at Ocean and Water in the medium. Where's the transparency on the safety, the, the harm, like people, radiation sickness causes weakness and fatigue, anxiety, depression, headaches, migraines, rapid heartbeat. There's a whole list. You are not being transparent about the harm that's omitted. And I have a question. This is the first time I've heard the term, and I don't have a cell phone, and I don't have a computer. What is dashboard? It sounds to me, and I'd like a response to this question, like this is a move to put almost everything on the computer, online, on wireless microwave radiation and not have in-person meetings or records available on paper. Could you answer that? Whenever I hear the word smart, I cringe because it means microwave radiation harm. Please respond, thank you. Uh, just a point of clarification there. I, I do not believe that this in any way will, these dashboards uh, will remove general information about county business that we continue to publish via paper. Uh, it's only an additional source of information available to the public uh, for greater transparency into the county's processes. That's correct. Other 
other there are other speakers. All right, well then with that, we'll end public comment and return it to the board for action. The motion will be in order. I'll move the recommended actions. I'll second. Motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Caput. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Koenig? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We will now move on to our uh, scheduled item for 10.45 a.m. This is Zone 7, uh, Flood Control District, and I will turn it over to Supervisor Zach Friend, who is our chair of Zone 7. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Madam Clerk, do we need some time in order to elevate people to panelists from other jurisdictions? Yes, I am having difficulties promoting Dr. Bilicic. Thank you. I've granted you speaking options, but you won't be able to share your screen or turn on your camera, unfortunately. Okay. I'm not seeing Director Colbertson online. I believe that Director Colbertson has traditionally called into these. So are there any call-in numbers perhaps? There are two call-in users, caller 9833 or call-in user, sorry, call-in user two is Marilyn Garrett. Director Colbertson, if you are on the line, please press star six to raise your hand and I can unmute your microphone. He's not appearing online. Thank you, Madam Clerk. All right, we are going to get moving then. We are going to call to order the Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 7 Board of Directors special meeting for January 25th, 2022. If we could have a roll call, please. Director Koenig. Here. Coonerty. Here. McPherson. Here. Thank you. Caput. Here. Bilicic. Here. Person is excused. Friend? Here. Lucas? Gonzalez? Parker? For the record, the last three were non voting members. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Strudley, are there any late addition, additions to today's agenda? Uh, no, Chair, friend, there are not. We'll now move on to item three, which is oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda but are within the zone seven purview or is there any member of the community that would like to address us? Yes, good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I live in rural Aptos. I want to encourage the all of the um, flood control zones to seriously consider groundwater recharge using stormwater runoff projects. There are some in the county managed aquifer recharge projects. And I, I think that's a real good step in the right direction using stormwater um, in a positive way that can help retard our groundwater aquifers. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else on Zoom? There are no speakers on Zoom or in chambers. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to the consent agenda, which are, excuse me, we'll move on to item four, which is the approval of the zone seven board meeting minutes. Are there any changes to the minutes by any of the directors? Hearing none, is there any member of the community that would like to address us on item four of the minutes? All right, we'll bring it back to the board for action. I'll move for approval of the minutes. Second. Uh yeah. We have a motion from Director Caput and a second from Director Koenig. If we could have a roll call, please. Director Koenig? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Caput? Aye. Illicich? Aye. Friend? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes with attendance. I think we'll move on to the consent agenda, which are items 8 through 11. Or is there any board member that would like to either comment on or pull an item from consent? <laughs> 
Uh, hearing none, is there any member of the community uh, under our structure here? It appears as though people haven't had an opportunity to speak on a consent agenda item. Is there any member of the community that would like to address us on consent? I'm seeing none. Uh, Madam Clerk, anybody on Zoom? There's no one. And as a reminder. Please go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Second. Okay, uh, Madam Clerk, uh, as you were saying. Just as a reminder for those on Zoom, it is star six to raise your hand if you're on the phone, or please click the hand icon at the bottom of your screen to be placed in the speaking queue. Speaking queue. Okay, well, seeing none on Zoom or in the chambers, we have a motion from Director Bilicic and a second from Director McPherson. If we could have a roll call, please. Director Koenig? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Caput? Aye. Dillisich? Aye. Friend? Aye. Thank you, motion passes with attendance. We'll move on to the regular agenda, and this is item six. This is the Board of Directors of Zone 7 to consider a status report on the Pajaro River Flood Risk Management Project as outlined in the memo of the District Engineer, and we have a Zone 7 Agenda Item Board memo. Dr. Strudley? <laughs> Thank you, Chair Friend, members of the board. Uh, I'm here to provide you with a status update on the Pajaro River Flood Risk Management Project and the pursuits that we are engaging in to try to secure ongoing state and federal investment and to move forward with uh, local revenue sourcing for the project. So we continue to engage with the federal government, uh, including the Army Corps, as well as our congressional delegation and other uh, members of White House and other agencies uh, in Washington, D.C. to try to secure federal investment in the project. Uh, we continue to receive very hopeful information uh, through Congressman Panetta's office, as well as through other contacts in Washington, D.C., that the values of this project are very strongly aligned with the administration's priorities. Um, and so we're very hopeful that we are going to be able to secure federal investment in the project for those reasons. Um, again, as I've reiterated to the board, um, really all the stars are in alignment on this project right now. And so this is the best time uh, that we've ever had in, in securing support uh, from the federal government for the project. We continue to utilize existing appropriations for the design phase, and we are awaiting hopefully the uh, allocation of appropriations for construction funding. And there will be numerous opportunities for that um, over the next year. Uh, and we continue to engage. And I want to thank uh, Super uh, excuse me, Director, uh, excuse me, Chair Zach Friend for um, leading that effort for us in Washington, D.C. and uh, assisting with uh, connecting staff with important members uh, on the Hill and at other agencies that are involved with appropriations. On the state side of the equation, uh, this month we are re-engaging with the State Department of Water Resources to uh, negotiate and secure our subventions cost share agreement with the state, as well as to secure a grant agreement under our tentative award under the Coastal Flood Risk, excuse me, Coastal Watershed Flood Risk Reduction Grant Program that was awarded to the district uh, last year. Um, it is still very important uh, and relevant to note the success that we have had with the passage and signing of SB 496. Um, we have uh, continued to thank profusely Senator John Laird for his authoring and shepherding that bill through a very challenging legislative season last year. Um, it is truly it remains a really groundbreaking law. Um, one that provides 100% cost share from the state for our non-federal cost to the project, which effectively erases the capital requirements of funding um, to be placed on the public. So in other words, the capital investment side is essentially free to us, provided by the federal government through their appropriations for the project and the state subventions cost share agreement. So this is a very, very big deal for us and, and hugely helpful to the project. Um, on the local side, the Pajaro Regional, Pajaro Regional Flood Management Agency, the JPA that was formed to oversee implementation of the project, as well as to oversee long-term operations and maintenance of the existing levees and any future facilities that are built. Uh, that agency continues to advance through its administrative startup procedures as the agency um, 
begins to grow uh, and, and walk and talk like its own agency. We, of course, we've had numerous board meetings already um, and the zone seven staff continue to operate under a services agreement that was struck between the, those two agencies uh, to perform that administrative work for the JPA as well as to advance um, the potential for bringing a special benefit assessment district um, Prop 218 compliant proposal to that board. So in order to fully secure the federal and state appropriations, the project will need to provide assurances of long-term operations and maintenance viability to the federal and state government. Um, and in order to do so, staff is currently in the midst of proposing to the JPA board the creation of a special benefit assessment district. Um, that process is unfolding through the beginning of this calendar year, 2022, um, and we expect to bring that proposal to that board's attention um, around April. Um, we have had a a con continued success uh, again on the federal side with Congressman Panetta's office, and I just wanted to mention that in addition to our pursuits for federal investment, what has really been helpful on that end uh, is the engineering with nature program. So the very, very benefits that uh, are so attractive to the state that led to successful passage of SB 496 are also now being um, heralded finally by the Army Corps of Engineers as, as other valuable multi-benefit aspects. And the levy setbacks that are proposed as part of the project offer a lot of expanded space for habitat, for groundwater recharge, uh, for other multi-benefit uses. And that is something that the Engineering with Nature program at the Army Corps of Engineers is interested in exploring with us. And the project has been labeled an Engineering with Nature pilot project by the Army Corps and carries that designation in its pursuit of federal appropriations for construction. So again, we're thankful to Congressman Panetta's office for shepherding those conversations and getting those conversations started uh, for bringing Dr. Todd Bridges out for a visit uh, to the Pajaro River levee system in November, uh, which would not have been possible without Congressman Panetta's assistance. Dr. Todd Bridges is the national program lead for that engineering with nature program. Um, so these are all very good um, indications uh, that we are continuing along a path of success and uh, uh, hope for a very bright future with uh, the levee reconstruction project. And with that, this is just a, a status update. So the recommended action is just to accept and file this, this status update, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Strudley. Are there any questions from directors? Director Bilicic? I just want to say we've done such outstanding work, and Mark, with your leadership, it's made all the difference. Um, you've been able to make the contacts. You've continuously gone forward, and we greatly appreciate all the efforts. We're almost there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Bill Sitch. Are there any other questions or comments on this item? Director Caput? Uh, um, yeah. Go ahead, Zach. No, please. I'm, I'm calling on you. Go for it. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, I want to thank, uh, you know, the... To get to the point where where we are right now, it's uh, it's amazing. Uh, so, how many years we've been working on this, and uh, the critical part is coming up now for the local uh, small match that we uh, have to come up with. Uh, losing in that election uh, for where the property owners and the floodplain have to vote on it. Uh, there's, uh, uh, it can't fail. It has to. It has to pass. Uh, this is an opportunity that uh, the public and especially the people in the floodplain. Uh, it's uh, it's critical. So anyway, uh, I guess pretty soon we're going to have that election, and I'm looking forward to working on that. And uh, I don't know, Mark. Can you mention? Uh, <coughs> I, I think we're going to have a smooth transition. Congressman Panetta has been doing a great job. And now we're going to have uh, Congresswoman uh, Lofgren. Uh, so there'll be a kind of a transition here right at the uh, the moment of uh, moment of truth, <laughs> actually. Well, I'm, I'm, um, I'm hopeful that uh, Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren joining in the fray will be advantageous to us. Uh, Congressman Panetta 
um, still retains jurisdiction over the lower part of the watershed and remains just as engaged and committed as he has always been. Um, so that is very nice to see. Um, and like I said, we hope Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren will uh, assist Congressman Panetta in, in building a stronger uh, base of support uh, on the Hill for the project. Um, so, yeah. You bet. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Strudley. Is there any member of the community that would like to address us on this item? <laughs> Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of rural Apcoff. I also want to thank um, Dr. Strudley. I didn't know you were a doctor now. Good, good job. That's a lot of work. <laughs> and I feel like we're very lucky to have you here working for us all in this county. And um, you've, you've helped move this project and other projects along in a very uh, professional and positive way. And I just really want to thank you. Regarding the special benefit assessment district that will be needed to be formed, um, having seen what happened in the um, Rio Domar flats with that special benefit assessment district getting voted down by the voters, it's going to be important that, um, that it's emphasized the benefit and the cost and what will happen if, if it doesn't go through. So, uh, going the extra yard and i'm calling on the county supervisors really to talk with your constituents to make it clear what this is about and all the work that dr strudley and others have done and the benefit that it will impose as a balance of the cost i think it was really unfortunate that the um, benefit assessment district in rio del mar flats didn't pass and all of that work had to just go away but at the same time, I was disappointed that the county didn't find a way to come up with some other means. So have a plan B, please, because these are tough times for all of us out there, trying to pay our taxes, trying to make our, keep our heads above water. So please have a plan B. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is there any other member of the community that would like to address us on this item? Madam Clerk, anybody on Zoom? There's no one on Zoom. All right, thank you. We'll bring it back to the board. It's an acceptance file, so this is an action item. If we could have a motion, please. I'll make a motion to accept this report. I'll second. We have a motion from Director Bilicic and a second from Director Caput. If we could have a roll call, please. Director Koenig. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Caput. Aye. Bilicic. Aye. Friend. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes with attendance. Thank you. We'll move on to the final item on today's agenda, which is as the Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District, or Zone 7, to consider nominations for the election of the Zone 7 Board of Directors Chairperson and Vice Chairperson as outlined in the memo of the District Engineer. And we have a memo for that item. Dr. Strudley. Thank you, Chair Ferret, friend, and members of the board. Um, uh, it is customary uh, for the first meeting of the year um, to elect a vice chairperson and chairperson uh, for the board um, and in conformance with our rules and regulations um, that election is scheduled for the first regular meeting of the calendar year in this case it is a special meeting um, the governance administration of our district has been very effective under the incumbent chair and vice chair and it remains very important to the success of the project in the pursuits of flood risk reduction in the Pajaro Valley to maintain that consistency and coherency as we move forward through really critical times related to federal appropriations for construction and so we do have a staff recommendation for the incumbent chair and vice chair to be reelected in those roles for the coming calendar year so the recommended action um, is for the vice chairperson to call for nominations and that the board elect a chairperson and vice chairperson for calendar year 2022 for zone seven. Director Bilicic. I just wanted to say that under your leadership these last few years we continue to move forward and we have never seen anything like this and uh, I can't say enough about you your leadership the team and I think it's an excellent idea to continue with you as chair. Thank you, Director Bilicic. Any other board members? Any nominations? I'll move the recommended actions. 
that vice chair. I'm sorry, uh, was that Director McPherson? Uh, did, it, did that include the nomination for vice chair as well? It, or continue? It did, yeah. Okay. Very well. So we have a motion. Is there a second on the nomination? Second. All right, we have a second from Director Koenig. Is there any member of the community that would like to address us on this item? <laughs> uh, seeing none in the chambers, is there anybody on Zoom, Madam Clerk? There is no one on Zoom. All right, thank you. We have a motion and a second. We'll bring it back to the board for a roll call vote. Director Koenig? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Caput? Aye. Bilicic? Aye. Friend? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes with attendance. And thank you all for nominating the two of us as chair and vice chair again. This will conclude uh, the Zone 7 meeting. I'll turn it back to uh, Chair Koenig to uh, reconvene the Board of Supervisors meeting. Thank you, Chair Friend. We'll now reconvene the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. It is 11.04, and we will proceed to item eight. Consider approval in concept of ordinance repealing Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 9.44, Live Oak Beach Permit Parking Zone, Schedule Ordinance for Final Adoption on February 1st, 2022, as outlined in the Memorandum of the Deputy CAO, Director of Public Works, Director Machado. Thank you, and good morning, Chair Koenig and Board of Members. Good to be here this morning. And so uh, the item before you is consideration for the repeal of County Code Chapter uh, 9.44 Live Oak Beach Permit Parking Zone. Uh, a bit of history on this um, I'd like to share. Early last year, we were developing a expanded program, a revised program, uh, and we received a considerable comment from the community uh, not very supportive of the existing program nor of the proposed changes to the program. We also received comment from uh, Coastal Commission and that was in April. Uh, they actually stated that uh, Coastal Commission does not support the permitted program or the modified program for 2021. Uh, in their view, the program should be discontinued entirely. That led us to action in uh, April where your board uh, recommended to pause the program for the year. Uh, staff's recommendation was to continue, but um, due to uh, consideration of comments uh, from Coastal and from the public, uh, the board chose to uh, pause the program for last year. Last summer, we did uh, keep track of any concerns, parking concerns. We also coordinated directly with Coastal Commission to understand if there was a program that we should be developing uh, to their liking, to the community's liking. Um, we did receive correspondence from, from our uh, partners at Coastal Commission. And again, they, uh, they stated that they were not supportive of the Live Oak parking program or any fee-based coastal parking program more broadly. Uh, they further stated that uh, they did not think it would be a good use of county staff or commission staff time or effort to uh, further work on such a program. That said, uh, we came back to the board in October and uh, our department recommended that the program be uh, dissolved. The board supported that recommendation, which leads us here today. The recommended action today is to consider in concept the adoption of an ordinance repealing Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 9.44, Live Oak Beach Permit Parking Zone, and to direct clerk of the board to schedule a second reading and final adoption of the ordinance for February 1, 2022. Uh, that concludes my report this morning, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Any questions from members of the board for Director Machado? Just have one question. Um, you know, we saw as, as I worked with you and your staff uh, at the beginning of last year, 2021, on trying to reform the program. Um, but at that time, the Coastal Commission, um, you know, had issues with the program, but at least the fact that the program had existed gave us, uh, you know, some leg to stand on in terms of the fact that there should be one going forward. So um, is does repealing the program completely as opposed to, you know, uh, simply uh, uh, 
uh, suspending it for another year. I mean, was there any, does it at least provide, a, a maintain a legal ability to have some kind of program in the future or, um, you know, is there, is there any reason why, why we should, I mean, why should we dissolve it completely as opposed to just continuing to suspend it? Well, I, I mean, clearly that's a policy decision for the board. I do believe that um, repealing the ordinance today would um, stop any future consideration unless we were to reconsider a new ordinance. And so it would be rather final with this action proposed today. Uh, but of course, uh, it is a policy decision. And so I would defer to the board if they, if you wanted to keep the conversation alive for another year. If we were to create a new program, would it you know, have any greater authority or be easier to do so under the existing ordinance or would it be better just to create an entirely new ordinance for a redesigned program? I think what I would say is that um, any modification to the program or creation of a new program will require coastal commission support. It will require a coastal permit. And to date, uh, they continue to uh, not support a paid parking program. And from our perspective, a paid parking program is the only way to make a program work in the area uh, with any benefit to any of our community members. And so um, it, you know, I don't know that keeping the existing ordinance is going to help us and any future ordinance will have to really um, resolve the issue of coastal commission's resistance to, to any sort of parking program that we could potentially operate and, and manage. Okay, thank you. Um, and of course, we have seen cases where uh, the commission itself took a different position uh, than coastal commission staff. Um, and of course, it is always a bit frustrating that um, you know, we're the ones that are burdened with maintaining the infrastructure and uh, actually managing um, the, the the area. And um, the coastal commission does not have those uh, same charges, um, but makes these sorts of recommendations. I would just say that um, as far as members of the public are concerned, I mean, the feedback was, um, you know, I continue to hear people request that we bring the program back. Although, um, as you pointed out, much of the discussion was around what the fee structure should be. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult. I, I, mean, I guess at this point, I see that in the future, if we were to uh, reimagine the program, it would be substantially different and um, therefore it would make more sense to simply reapproach it as a new ordinance. Um, and, uh, I, you know, also I think one thing we, we both realized, uh, you as director um, with staff and myself uh, and the office managing public comments uh, about the program last spring. Um, I think it was actually the high point of the year in terms of emails and, and comments we received. And so the marginal utility of, uh, of a program and its ability to actually control some of the issues that folks are concerned about, driveways being blocked, um, and just maintaining general order uh, in the beach area during the summer months. Um, you know, the, the, the expense of staff time and managing the program is, is far outweighs the uh, little, those, the few improvements we actually saw with the program uh, in effect. And I think that actually uh, we did hit on a good solution with the sheriff's office bringing over their school resource officers uh, to the Live Oak area during uh, those summer months to um, help maintain orderly conduct by all visiting the beach. So, um, you know, I'm fine with the recommended actions today, uh, recognizing that, um, you know, things may change in the future. And at that point, we would want to reapproach the program uh, with, with the new lens. Are there any members of the public that wish to speak on this item? Thank you for this report. Uh, Becky Steinbrunner from Rural Aptos. I did participate in those public meetings when it was uh, going to look like, when it looked like this was going to be expanded countywide. And so I'm really glad that the Coastal Commission has convinced your leadership to, um, to do away with that idea, to um, allow for equitable coastal access by everyone. I am heartened that with the suspension of the program last summer, it was not a hardship, it sounds like, on, on people living in those areas. 
and I appreciate that there was maybe some extra um, share of presence there to help with any any problems. So I'm, I'm very glad to see that this is being repealed. <laughs> it's a very good move. Thank you on the on the basis of uh, the people. And I, I do think that um, just for clarification, it would be wise for your board to consult with county council about any legal ramifications of doing this in terms of setting precedents for um, either a similar program or for other uh, types of programs in the county. Um, I also want to just point out that I remember that the, the money that was going to be generated from the, the new program in the Live Oak area was to support the um, private speech. And now with the dissolution of the Opal Cliffs Recreation District, um, it, it, I just want to make sure that your board is looking at that and that um, that beach access will be maintained in a, in a good way. And I'd really like to see that locked gate and fence go away. Thank you for taking this action today. I think it's a good move on support of the public and beach access for all. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone on Zoom wish to make a comment? Yes, there's one caller. Caller user two, your microphone is available. Um, thank you for your comments, Becky Steinbrunner. They were right on the mark. We need equitable coastal access and permit parking is does not sound worthwhile in to benefit the public or use of county time. And so I'm glad to see you're planning to repeal this. And the Coastal Commission comments uh, were quite valuable. So those, those are my comments. Permit parking, there's already too much of it <laughs> all over. Thank you. There are no other speakers. Thank you, then we'll return it to the board for action. And Mr. Chair, I'd like to first actually just uh, provide a note of commendation for your work on this process. This is a very difficult situation for you to come into. You tried to bring a lot of the parties together. This has been a legacy -ish program that's had issues from our board as well as from the community. And I think that you did uh, what you could do to try and uh, preserve access as well as ensuring that public works had what they needed and that, that the needs of the residents were made. So I just wanted to make sure that you get acknowledged for your hard work in this process. So I, I will move the recommended actions. Second. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Friend. We have a motion by Friend and a second by Coonerty. Any further discussion? Um, I would actually just pose to one of the questions raised. Um, I, I believe it was part of my initial line of questioning, but could County Council clarify does repealing um, this ordinance today in any way you know, preclude us from a, a, another parking ordinance in the future? No, it, wouldn't, it will not preclude you from doing another parking ordinance in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Community? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Koenig? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. We will now proceed to item nine. Consider the case transition plan for the Office of the Public Defender, approve addition and unfunding of one full-time equivalent chief PD investigator, five full-time equivalent alternately staffed legal secretary, one, two senior legal, senior legal secretary, two full-time equivalent paralegal, one full-time equivalent receptionist, one full-time equivalent administrative aide, and one full-time equivalent senior social worker. Approve transfer of appropriations and fixed fixed asset purchases in the amount of $15,000 for network switches and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the public defender. Public defender Rogers. Thank you. 
That better. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Supervisors, CAO Carlos Palacios, and the County Transition Team for your unwavering support of the new Office of the Public Defender and for your commitment to ensuring a smooth transition of public defense services from the private firm of Bigham Christensen and Minsloff to our new county agency. Our mission guides our case transition plan to courageously defend the accused, to demand equal justice for all, to empower our clients with inspired advocacy in the courtroom and community. We're on a mission to elevate public defense one client at a time. Our transition plan reflects the values that we share with this community. We're courageous, compassionate, client-focused, creative, collaborative, and culturally responsive. And in keeping with this mission and with our values, we're committed to transitioning public defense services in a way that prioritizes continuous representation, an orderly transition, and exceptional service. We're committed to providing continuous representation. And what that means is that clients will have the same defense team throughout the transition, including a dedicated investigator and a dedicated attorney. Continuous representation is critical to maximizing consistency for our clients and minimizing disruption for our partners. We're working closely with BCM to reach this goal. BCM's attorneys have accepted positions with our agency, and we're actively recruiting BCM's investigators and support staff to our team. We expect nearly all of BCM staff to join us on opening day, July 1st, 2022, and we're grateful and privileged to have them continue this work that they've been doing for so long in this community. We're working with BCM to track new staff assignments as closely as possible to previous assignments to avoid the need to reassign cases. And for cases where continuous representation is impossible, we've leveraged model practices to create a case transfer procedure to support seamless transfers. We're committed to ensuring an orderly transition. Communication and collaboration are key. I've met with over 50 stakeholders and the court's leadership team to discuss our transition plan, share ideas, and strengthen our relationships with our court, county, and community partners. I'll continue to make myself available to our partners and our community, and especially our clients throughout this transition. We're working to develop clear procedures and workflows for first appearances, sharing evidence with the DA's office and case management. We're implementing a new case management system. We're working with BCM to digitize and transfer client files. And our IT business systems analyst plans to test technology early and often to get the glitches ironed out before opening day. We're rolling out a crisis response protocol to anticipate and plan for challenges. We are committed to providing every client who is entrusted to us with exceptional service. Being client focused means that during this transition and beyond, we'll put our clients at the center of every tactic, strategy, and decision. We're recruiting and training skilled leaders to guide our agency. We're working with the seasoned defenders at BCM to develop strong defense teams led by respected attorneys with deep experience in our community. We're creating a training program to support our staff through the transition. And I'm excited to report that the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers has awarded us technical and training assistance to host a holistic defense summit to train our team and our community on model practices we'll be embracing. We'll have the opportunity to learn with their assistance about things like early representation, vertical representation, and holistic defense. Throughout the transition, we'll continue to engage with our clients and our community and remain responsive to the needs of those we serve. 
This is a historic moment for Santa Cruz County as we work together to open our first public defense agency. We're confident that with your support, we'll transition services in a way that reflects our mission and values and moves us closer to our vision. It's our vision to lead the charge in transforming public defense to empower those we serve by honoring their experiences, amplifying their voices, and offering real solutions to the root causes of system involvement. And it's in that spirit that I ask you to accept and file our transition plan and to approve our recommendations. Thank you so much for your time and support. We're looking forward to continuing to serve this community on opening day. Thank you. Are there questions from members of the board for Public Defender Rogers? Mr. Chair, I don't have a question, I just have a, a comment. I, I'm very excited about this transition. I, I think that we absolutely chose the right person and in many respects, the right person chose us too. We're, we're very pleased to have you, uh, Ms. Rogers. And it just goes to show with not just this initial transition plan, but some of the items that were on today's board agenda that Supervisor Coonerty had mentioned that we really are transitioning to the best form of indigent defense that we can within our county. Um, and like a lot of things we do in Santa Cruz County, I think that we're gonna become a model in this way, uh, in ways that we haven't been before. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to this next chapter and, and uh, I appreciate the work. Yeah, thank I would repeat that. I want to thank um, Heather Rogers, our public defender, uh, for working to establish uh, the transition for the casework that you're about to oversee um, in the office. It's critical that we resource this office properly to have a smooth transition. And I appreciate all of the cooperation among our different justice partners to set this office up for very good success in the future. And congratulations to all. We look forward to it and becoming official on July 1st. Thank you. Supervisor Caput. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, your staff. Uh, also, it's been a very difficult time uh, to do a transition. And uh, somehow it uh, seems to be working. So I'm all for it. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing. Yeah, uh, thank you. I want to echo my colleagues' comments. Um, and I think it's helpful that we have somebody uh, from this community who has the relationships and shares the values uh, as we build this new office. I guess my only question is, uh, as you've begun to build this out, is there anything that has um, surprised you in a good or, or, or bad way ab about this transition that, that you hadn't expected? Well, thank you all for your support and thank you for an excellent question. You know, what's really surprised me, Supervisor Coonerty, is just the groundswell of support and collaboration that we've received in this effort. I want to especially acknowledge Larry Bigham, Jerry Christensen, and John Minsloff, the entire team at BCM, who already are looking forward to making this vision a reality and working very closely with us to make the transition as smooth as possible. So I think what this building of this new agency shows us is what we already knew about our county and our community. And it's that when we set our minds to do something, we work together to get it done. And I've been um, not surprised so much as just really grateful and um, you know tremendously honored to be working with so many talented people. And I have to also thank CAO Carlos Palacios, Nicole Coburn, Finn Stafford. Everyone has just um, you know had their oars oaring in the, the same direction to make this happen. It's been a big lift at a time when our, our county is facing so many other challenges. And I know that together we'll get there. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to echo those comments. You know, it was really enlightening reading um, your report and seeing your presentation, as well as uh, reading item 37 on the consent agenda today uh, for non-attorney advocates uh, to really, you've really painted a picture for me of how your office um, will be, uh, will holistically approach the process of uh, recovery for people who, who find themselves in need of a public defender to begin with. I was wondering if you could just uh, comment a little bit more about um, you know, how the non-attorney advocates will work with the senior, senior social workers in your office uh, to provide those kinds of services. Are, are they the ones that would ultimately receive kind of the handoff of those, those training and skills from the non-attorney advocates? How will they work together on your, uh, your That's a great, 
Great question. I'm so excited to tell you more about this model because this agency that we're contracting with, Partners for Justice, I think just has a, a tremendous um, model and a tremendous vision for public defense. And so the idea behind Partners for Justice is that it can be difficult for smaller communities like ours to embrace holistic defense and to build capacity to provide these services, especially if you're transitioning from a more traditional system. And so what we'll have in our office is at least one senior social worker. We'll have three advocates. And what they'll bring right on July 1st is first of all, deep, deep training in holistic defense, in wraparound support, in trauma-informed practices that they'll share with our team. And so they come as client advocates, but also as advocates for holistic defense who embed in our office to help build us up and train us in what we'll need to do to do this work well. The other thing that they'll do is they'll engage in service mapping for us. And so part of what the advocates do is they come to a community and they reach out and they make all of those connections that you need to make to create a web to really understand what clients need in a given moment and how to link them to that supportive service. They'll develop an air base, um, a database for us. And they'll also reach out and make the actual human relationships with folks so that our database has a live presence behind it. And we begin to form the relationships that we'll need to truly provide holistic defense moving forward. And then on the ground with three advocates, we'll be able to have an advocate in our misdemeanor teams and two advocates in our felony teams. My hope is that we can initiate early representation, which means getting to clients as early as possible in the process to try to implement things like diversion or no files. They'll also be in the courtrooms, helping our attorneys and our teams, you know, navigate the difficult issues that come up when so many of our clients are involved in the system due to underlying issues like co-occurring disorders, hopelessness, depression, substance abuse. And they'll be there to, to work hand in hand with our attorneys to bring that soft touch and, and those holistic skills that will allow us to make connections and support our, our clients there. And then of course, back in the office, they'll be the ones who are making the calls to make sure that our clients are on the right list, are hooked up with the right people, make their appointments, know where to go, know what's expected of them. And so these, these three people will be really doing a huge lift for us as we try to really embrace holistic defense coming from a model um, that has been incredibly client-centered, but hasn't necessarily embraced that social support piece of the puzzle as much as we'd like to in the new agency. All right, thank you for that explanation. Thank you for your question. All right, are there members of the public who'd wish to comment on this item? Seeing none in the chambers, is there anyone on Zoom? There is no one on Zoom. All right, then I will return it to the board for action. Motion would be in order. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Moved by Supervisor McPherson, seconded by Supervisor Friend. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Abbott? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Koenig? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That brings us to the end of our regular agenda. The board will now move into closed session if there is no objection. And uh, are there, is there anything, uh, any reportable actions that will come out of closed session today? No, there are no reportable actions today. All right. Thank you, everybody. And the next regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors will be February 1st. Uh, that is a week from today at 9 a.m. Thank you.